Oh, I'm sorry. Did I break your concentration? Somewhere between science and superstition. Such sights to show you. Strange Eons. Welcome to Strange Eons Radio. That's Eric over there. Hello. That's Vanessa over there. Hello. I'm Kelly. Uh, We are recording this on Vanessa's birthday. It is my birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Oh, Vanessa. you guys remembered. I'd like to point out that you asked us if we could record this a little early today because it's your birthday. Yes. And you showed up late. Five <laughs> minutes. I'm just saying. I know. I, the this... lack of disrespect. Wait a second. No. The what? amount of disrespect and the lack of respect. It's so early, I can't think straight. And yet you decided to sleep in a little bit. Your birthday, after all. I did not sleep in at all. I got up way in advance. I just you probably somehow... didn't go to sleep. <laughs> I did not go to sleep until 2. I am very tired. But because I was prepping for this awesome show that well, well, I love tell being us, a part of. Tell us this if you can. Sure. I know mom's listening. Uh, oh my god this is uh we are recording this early so you can get on with the festivities i assume yes uh-huh. and uh can you share what the festivities are so i don't know if you guys know this about me but i really like dinosaurs like a lot and you're hanging out with two right now <laughs> <laughs> i'm just gonna let that lie <laughs> um, but yeah so there's um in south of seattle some in some warehouse there's like a big installation where you can go and check out like big scale dinosaur attractions. And then there's a VR part where you like put on a headset and it's like, I'm walking with dinosaurs. So yeah. So the last like entry is at a certain time. And so I needed to push this back a little earlier so I could make it. Uh, I have seen the advertisements for this. It yeah. looks like a lot of fun and I await your review. Yes. Yeah. I am stoked. I can definitely talk about that uh, at some point. Yes. Yes. Not- not quite yet. <laughs> Not quite yet. But uh, yes, I will definitely give my review of the dinosaur experience. It's a wonderful example of, because you know, I think that's pretty cool and fun of the nerd level sitting yeah. at this table. <laughs> what are you doing for your birthday? I'm going to a museum. <laughs> I, I, can, I can identify with that. I, yes. <laughs> well, it's so funny because it's like, I don't want to do anything that's going to make me tired. And I want to stay out late and I don't want to socialize. <laughs> So my the, the number of activities of what I would do on my birthday are pretty slim. It's like, okay, I could go for a hike. That's fine if the weather's good. I can see a movie, but I've seen them all. Right. So what's left? I've seen all the movies. All the I guess this will be our theater. last episode for <laughs> Vanessa at least. I can rewatch them. It's fine. Oh, okay. I've never felt more connected to you than you saying on your birthday, I don't want to stay out late. Yes. <laughs> I yes. don't. That's me. Uh, you know, I, I think after I turned 30, I, that just all of a sudden I was like, I'm tired. I just <laughs> am tired now. You're turning 31 and now you're like, <laughs> yeah. it's all downhill. That's right. Yes. Yes. Forever. <laughs> For all of time, I will be 31. It'll be great. Uh, well, the big thing that came on this weekend, I don't know if you've watched or if you have any interest in watching, is the two episodes of Lord of the Rings that dropped. I sure did. Me too. Damn. Okay, what do we think of this? Oh, well, um, I thought it would be garbage because Amazon sucks at making <laughs> good properties good. Uh, Halo sucked. Um, that wasn't Amazon. Oh, was it not? Was no, that, that was Hulu? Paramount. Oh, that was Paramount. Okay, well, there's I mean, lots you're of... correct, but... There's <laughs> lots of... We all know there's awful, awful atrocities made by Amazon because they have a lot of money and they don't super care. Yeah. So I was like, it's going to suck. <laughs> a lot of money. A lot of money. In this case. And it was really good. I felt like it was super solid. I don't even like Lord of the Rings that much. I hate the extended editions. I'm like, fucking move on with it, please. I don't need the third angle shot of fucking Gandalf, but it's fine. Um, yeah, I had a good time with it. Um, we'll we'll see kind of where it goes, but so far I was really really impressed. What did what did you guys think? I liked it. Yeah, I didn't love it. Yeah. Um, but I liked it. I I know that. This will probably piss a lot of people off. I could just never get into Game of Thrones, but I never got into Game of Thrones, like the books and all of that. Sure. 
and uh, Lord of the Rings was a big part of my reading experience as a kid. I remember oh, my brother yeah. giving me the trilogy when I was like 11 and saying, here you go. Whoa. And so that was, that was, uh, that was something that I, I think probably I took going into this was, mm -hmm. oh, I like, I know these names and I like a lot of what I'm seeing. Some of the effects were a little shaky. Oh, uh, interesting. Some of the acting I thought was a little shaky, <laughs> but I, I was like, okay, I'm definitely interested in who this mysterious meteor man is. Oh, yeah. I love watching everyone on the internet, like, yell at each other over it. I'm like, well, I, but I'm going to just take what's happening in the music and apply that to my thoughts of who this will hmm. be. And at this point, I'm probably team uh, Gandalf, but uh, just because the music is so whimsical. But who knows? Who knows? And I, I, it, I, you know. He's a different name, though. And like the sum, is this? Well, I thought this was the Silmarillion they're out adapting, or is no, this still part of the? No, of the which is story? crazier even when oh, you yeah. start thinking about this. No, I mean what is crazy is Amazon paid uh, half a billion dollars mm -hmm. for the rights to the footnotes of Lord of the oh, Rings. Oh, that's okay. That's the incredible. Silmarillion has already been purchased. They don't have the rights to that story. Whoa. <laughs> I did not see how you could possibly adapt that other than like well, uh, like 20 years of TV show or something. Yeah, and you would, so you would have to adapt it like, uh, I mean, you would have to look at it as a history yeah, text yeah. and then make an original story that is happening with these events going on or something like that. Mm -hmm. So this is really just, you know, they don't, I don't think they have the rights to the name Gandalf. So that's why I don't think they can use it. Oh, interesting. Oh, really? So I don't think that's him. Oh. I think we'll find out that he is either a new character or they're going to um, push because the age of the wizards, Gandalf and Saruman and all that was mm -hmm. the age of the beginning of the Lord of the Rings age, yeah. the third age. Mm -hmm. yeah, this so is Gandalf a, shouldn't be around. Yeah. It's a long time before the Lord of the Rings movies. Yeah. I sit kind of in the middle with it, partially because, like, something like that, like, I didn't realize it's footloads, because as soon as I saw it announced, I know I'm going to watch it, so I really don't read anything about anything yeah. like that I want to watch that much. Mine was similar, except I had a teacher start read. We had a teacher that read The Lord of the Rings to us in, like, the second or third grade or That's some the insanely way to do young it. age for it. Wow. So, yeah, I, I'm with you in that. It seeped in the <laughs> my life. And it, uh, my biggest problem I've having with it so far hasn't been story, hasn't been, it's just kind of a tone. It feels more like the Hobbit movies mm -hmm. than the Lord of the Rings movies. Oh, and the Hobbit movies to me were largely a failure. Mm -hmm. The Lord of the Rings are fucking brilliant. Mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing adaptations of those books. But the Hobbit tried to do more with the books than was there. Yeah. And didn't necessarily succeed in a lot of the things. There's some great stuff in that that works really well, especially the casting of some of the dwarves. But this feels a little like that. And there are moments where I realize how much they're spending them going with the effects where that was also the problem I had with The Hobbit. It had a sheen over it. You yeah. know, it just felt so shiny. Yeah, like just uh, that brightness. Yeah, there are shots yeah. of um, the lead, uh, I forget the character's name, the woman who... Galadriel? Yeah. That almost looked like they've put zoom filters over her face or something mm -hmm. to sort of make her look more ethereal. Mm -hmm. and I don't think it necessarily works. <laughs> so it's it's... I'm waiting mm. on story. We'll see where the story goes, because they really yeah. have just started stuff, so I'm not going to battle the idea of, well, oh, this doesn't seem perfect right now. Yeah. But uh, I hope it pulls back on the sheen, which I'm sure it won't, because they spent a fucking fortune. It's the most expensive TV show ever produced. Well, I wonder heard. if uh, I, I wonder if we'll see a difference in the look of it as the show continues. I hope so. Because uh, we're in a good part yeah. of the first stage here, yeah. and as we move into Sauron showing up, and um, in the footnotes they talk about Sauron. Uh, ingratiates himself, kind of goes undercover and gets in with a group of people who are building the rings. And that's right. how he creates that one ring that, oh. that rules them all, kind of without them knowing. So, um, you know, that's 
if I were to guess with anybody else who's guessing who the Meteor Man is, Sauron seems the most likely to me. Right, plot-wise, like yeah. if, if they are going yeah. off of the... But the I don't think that's going to be it either. I think that the fact that he's um, he's being tended to by the, uh, the Harfoots, yeah. that I think he's going to end up being some kind of force for good yeah. somehow. So do they not have the rights to the word Hobbit? Well, by this time, and God, I'm such a fucking nerd. No, I'm fascinated because I couldn't get through them. <laughs> the so. hobbits wouldn't have existed yeah. by this time yet. The Harfoots would have been their ancestors, and yeah. there are uh, a number of different Harfoot races that would eventually become That's yeah, why they look a little hobbits. different and they live a little different. Yeah, they're yeah, they're similar, super nomadic. But, and but, yeah. Good thing hobbits, I never want to get late again. Because right. well, like, <laughs> the hobbits never want to go any place, and they're more traveling Right. And so there's yeah, because I, I kind of but... I, I kind of figured it's because we're so f much further back in time that they would be called a Harfoot. But I also was like, well, maybe that's a family name because they always had like the different family sex of the oh, like sure. hobbits. So I was like, oh, okay, like maybe it's that. But yeah, I I just don't know because I never read them. Um, so I'm fascinated. So this is all stuff that you that that does exist in Lord of the Rings. It exists as. Footnotes. So it's like literally like a sentence or two or right. three or mm -hmm. ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. Exactly right. Wow. It's just, a, I mean, it really is wow. a testament to how important he is to the fantasy genre that, you know, yeah. people are willing to pay half a billion dollars to get the rights <laughs> to a few scribbles he made, you know, to keep his own story straight in his own head. Well, yeah, Amazon, I think, is doing a whole big push for number of uh, Lord of the Rings uh pieces because well, i think more stuff is coming out not Bezos just this is a huge fan apparently oh. lord of the rings he spearheaded buying figuring out what he could get mm. to do something with it yeah so it's part of where it's coming from oh interesting i was the first when i heard this to say i don't need another fucking lord of the rings we got mm -hmm. a good lord of the rings and this is you know obviously not a new adaptation of that so i'm like oh i think i'm digging this yeah, I, like I said, I, I want to see where the story goes. I'm sort of like, well, okay, this this is a nice world they'll build. They're building. Let's see where it ends up. So, um, so I, speaking of movies that have like a weird sheen on them, okay, um, I saw Three Thousand Years of Longing. That's the Tilda Swinton, Idris Elba, oh. like oh, he's is this a the genie. new George Miller film. Mm -hmm. Oh, whoa, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, there's like a number of films that have happened in the past where you're following like these little mini stories that are sort of these fantastical rewritings of moments of history or just something. And I know that, um, Terry Gilliam had done it for some movie or another already. I, you know, uh, mm. <laughs> there's this film, I, it's hard because you don't, they leave a really big question mark at the end and either direction, it's terribly unsatisfying. So the, the journey along the way where you're being given these little interesting stories about the history of this genie, really good, beautiful, crazy, strange stories. But the main story with Tilda Swinton, like it's weird and it doesn't really add up and it's kind of messed up. And then at the end, you're like, am I in... Um, a speed racer because the grass is so green and the sky is so oh. blue and it's like weirdly made and there's a lot of just shooting up into nothing and i'm, I'm just like i don't know what this film is i wasn't in love with it but, oh, okay yeah. well, that's, oh well this isn't um this sounds not like studio interference, but like they let him do whatever Artistic. he wanted. Yeah, this I think this is very much like, hey guys, I made one for you. Now I get one for me. Yeah, um, yeah I think this, it, I don't know if it's like, it, it's based off of a kid's book, I think. And it's something that I, he probably did for his kids. I don't know. It's. Does it feel like a kid's movie? In many ways along the way, there is a lot that is geared kind of towards that, but then there's definitely some adult stuff in there too. So, yeah. yeah. So one to maybe check out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it depends on how much you're into that sort of fantastical, like crazy storytelling sort of stuff. And, you know, if you're a huge, well, you can't be, a, I guess it doesn't matter if you like the director because this is way off the mark of what he normally does. But yeah. yeah. Let's not forget he did the amazing uh, Babe 2. Oh, Pig in the City. A, 
dark children's tale. Yeah. Well, what a really dark version. I don't think babe. I saw it because oh, it's great. It's oh, really? Really different. It's yeah. quite a different take. Does it have babe. James Cromwell in it still? I think he's in the beginning. I yeah. can't remember. It's I just remember thinking, city, so. I don't think I would take a child to see this. They'd be crying at the end of this movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the uplifting story of the bam, baby. <laughs> I mean, I was just a little too old and a little too cool in my life at that point to see sure. it because, like, I'd seen Babe, obviously. But by the time <laughs> I, Babe 2 came out, I was like, um, that's for kids. Right. Huh. All righty. Interesting. Well, then I guess all I've got to say is, nope. <laughs> oh, it happens. We have the three of us have finally watched Nope. So and, for uh, first, uh, you're... Your general feelings. I, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, the it definitely sits right in the middle of his, his three films. You know, it's going to be hard to ever top Get Out, but I thought, especially as a whole, I thought it was far superior film to Us. Sure. Everybody, the acting and stuff is interesting. The people are fun to watch and compelling, which is good because not a lot happens for mm-hmm. forty-five minutes yeah. of the film. Which you know, hey. And unlike a lot of movies that say, well, we're setting up characters, they actually were setting up characters. <laughs> and yeah. I thought they did a pretty decent job. Um, are we going to go spoilery on this? Uh, yeah. If you haven't seen Nope, you know, maybe tune out for the next two minutes yeah. or something. Um, I, I don't know spoilery, but uh, well, the one thing I really, really loved was the sound of the ship oh was my the screams God. of everybody digesting Jesus, inside. That oh was my so unexpected. God. <laughs> like, and that starts with going, what the hell is going Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> That is when I when I first saw it and I was mentioning there are scenes that stuck with me and I cannot get out of my head. That is one of them. Watching them slowly just kind of get all in a line going up and then like, what the fuck is going on? But did you feel I and here's where it kind of where it's not a masterpiece to me. I needed just a little more explanation. Yeah. Yeah. Where is this thing from? Why is it? regularly hanging out here yep mm-hmm. and why is it so distracted by flags and floppy things but then that stuff i can able... kind of go okay that's just what it is but how would they kind of how do they know that though yes <laughs> and and the part where he you know he knew not to look at it and that's how you would let it pass you by mm. based on the fact that he knew that some animals are like that mm-hmm. like this is a real fucking leap yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I kind of uh, forgave that because if it's a predator, then it's kind of like, okay, I, I get that. And that's sort of, he understands how predator animals versus prey animals kind of function. But I think the, the background that I heard on where that alien concept with it, with being in the desert and maybe this other creature, um, it's apparently based on actual weird random findings where sometimes in the desert, apparently people have found these huge like jellyfish style things just dead. And so there's been this long running like, hmm, is there something out there that we aren't aware of? And people have theorized yeah. about it. And so I think that's what it comes from. But he doesn't make that very clear. Yeah, I forgot the name of it, but there is a ranch out in the middle of nowhere that is considered one of those skinwalker yeah skinwalker ranch and Mm. this felt sort of like they were pulling from that idea like the one guy driving up on the motorcycle saying your whole place is blurred on google maps why is that Mm. and uh, that's one of those big Mm. theory things that people toss out going well why is it blurry Mm -hmm. probably the people that own it and operate it go hey why don't you because you can request Google right. Maps to blur your thing. It's like, well, we're mysterious and weird. Let's add to that. <laughs> but uh, overall, I, just, uh, I thought the movie was a lot was fun and uh, what it should be. You know, there's nice, creepy shit going on. There's interesting humor. There's just just a good movie. Yeah, I, I love the character flaws in it, too. Mm-hmm. Like just everyone's kind of got a flaw and it really helps make them a more full interesting person and it, that's just so cool i don't know I've, it felt like the real people that i actually kind of cared about so it's yeah. cool well and also a nice kind of um a look at how hollywood treats 
it's yeah talent. Oh yeah. sure, uh, Gordy, yeah. the the chimp going crazy oh, and everything Jesus. is you know an obvious an obvious reference to you know you get told what to do in this business and mm -hmm. if you don't then you're out of the business and it's just kind of nice to see somebody snap. <laughs> yeah, there, there was there mm -hmm. that did lead to another thing that I thought was like, I don't see SNL doing a skit about that. No, <laughs> you know, little things like that where they yeah. everybody made jokes and fun about. It's like nobody made jokes about the Twilight Zone movie. You yeah. know, when people are actually killed, but right. I can see why it's there for the purpose of the movie. Yeah, so it's sort of like okay, we'll just go with this. Right. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I wonder if that's actually a bigger commentary. Because um, uh, Key and Peele were rejected from SNL. Right. And I wonder if that's a little tiny jab at like, hey, fuck you. Remember <laughs> me? Fuck you. <laughs> like, but who, who, who knows? I mean, I, I kind of got it. I, I just was like, okay, well, maybe they're just being like, oh, it's just irreverent. And like this like extreme idea in this particular world where SNL would do something like that. But it was, it was a weird, interesting moment where they're like talking about actors that we know in mm. skits. Yeah, it was just bonkers. Like yeah. my brain's really trying to. Yeah, that was rough, man. Some of that, yeah. that yeah. scene when he's under the table is like, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. Um, I did a revisit on a film, mm. oh, nice. and it relates to uh, something that uh, we'll be talking about later with uh, something else, but <laughs> it brought me, after watching that, it brought me back to Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, ah. which uh, what I really wanted to watch was Nightmare on Elm Street 4, because I had heard some uh, film reviewers talking about how great it was, and mm. I was like, I don't remember it being great. Okay. And they were saying, you know, that was their favorite. They were the right age when that came out. They saw it in the theaters, and they were like, I love this were movie. Were they 12? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay, then, that, then I could see that. But yes. I mean, these films are kind of all... I was 15 or yeah. 14 when the first one came out, so, you know, that is the right age to be watching these kind of movies. But, uh, uh, so, and aside, Nightmare on Elm Street, all of the movies are on HBO Max, mm -hmm. except for four. Oh, weird. What? Yeah. So huh. one, two, three, five, six, the new remake and Jason versus Freddy. Oh, weird. All of them on there except for part four. It's like Phantasm 2. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I ended up really, really liking this part three. And I, I've always liked it, but I thought I kind of liked it because it was the right age and it had Dawkins. Dawkins. <laughs> it had the return of Nancy and all that stuff. But I still like it for all of that stuff. John Saxon, uh, hmm. fucking yeah. great in this as her dad, who was the sheriff who was turned into a complete alcoholic mess because his wife was killed and his daughter was crazy and all of that stuff. And uh, I thought the kills were really good. Um, and I think this is maybe, I had thought this was the last one before Freddy got kind of silly. Mm -hmm. no. But these film reviewers were saying number four was the last one where he was still scary. There were a couple of um, couple of good, uh, funny lines. Uh, it it very much reminded me of the uh, Rick and Morty episode where they have that Freddy Krueger look like <laughs> chasing them, and all he does is coming to get you, bitch. <laughs> and you know, Morty looks up to Rick. He says, he says "bitch" an awful lot, <laughs> and that was just started in this movie because it's all "Welcome to Prime Time, bitch," and uh, all of that stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of bitch in there. I, I guess I would disagree a little bit with that group because I, I don't know, three or four or five years ago, I watched the whole series, one through the new nightmare. And uh, I think one is the only scary one. I think one still holds up as having some fucking creepy ass move sure, that yeah. the body bag in the hall and mm -hmm. some of that stuff. And Freddie is flat evil. Right. Uh, two sort of a weird misstep for the Freddy character, mm -hmm. whatever else you think of the movie. The Freddy character is way off base in that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in three, I think is where, for me, where he became, he becomes the jokester, like the welcome to primetime bitch and the lines like that. Cause he didn't say anything like that in the first movie. Yeah. Um, and I didn't think three or four, even when I originally saw him, one was the only one that I thought was scary. Mm -hmm. Saw three or four, you know, in my teens, didn't think they were scary. It's like, wow, these are really silly. Fun. I like three. 
I'll I don't, say this. I, like I think that I've, uh, as I've gotten older, I look at things a little more like, uh, would this scare me if it was happening? And I'm able to get scared. Yeah. So in three, he, uh, he cuts the kid's tendons out and walks him out off onto the edge w- like a marionette. Uh, yeah. And I was fucking terrified. That's pretty grim. That yeah. is a good, that is the, the creepiest scene in that movie. Definitely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, there's still moments in three and four. Once you get to five, boy, when yeah. you bring in Alice Cooper and, uh, <laughs> oh my <laughs> God, dude, it's so, so bad. I think New Nightmare is pretty good too, but yeah. uh, it's very different. Um, of its time too, man. <laughs> I remember seeing New Nightmare not too long ago, and I was thinking uh, Robert England definitely subscribes to the idea of there are no small parts, yes. only small actors. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is very yes. true. <laughs> I think his his uh, his outgoing message when they call him is, uh, "Please leave a message, but I plan on being gone for a long." Long time. <laughs> wow. Is this how you talk? Nice. nice. Um, yeah. So uh, I, I had mentioned previously that I checked out Orphan in prep of seeing oh, yes. Orphan first kill. And Great anticipation here. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, um, well, uh, I was a little like, okay, first of all, you, it's hard to take that actress and then pretend like she's younger slash. Is this, a, this is a prequel. To it's that. a prequel. But it's the same actress. But it's the same actress. From a movie 10 years ago. Uh-huh. Who was supposed to look like a 13 like year old or something or younger. Oh, yeah. Well, like 11, maybe. Did you bother to research and see how old the actress actually is? She's got to be 40. Oh, she's got to be. I, she's definitely in her 30s. And you, you're just watching it going, does anybody think that she really is like a kid in this? Because that's ridiculous. They like, haven't de-aged her or? They, I think they tried. And they did. the worst thing that they did, though, is from the back and sides, it is always a little girl, like a little kid oh. as a stand-in. And then every time they wrap around, it's her head. Her giant adult head. And it's like, <laughs> no, this doesn't work at all, guys. Like, there's just the effects. I mean, because it's first kill and it's going back to, like, a different story of hers. I'm like, why didn't she just pretend to be a little older? Because she doesn't have to stick with that p- yeah. specific age. So it was really weird, like, decision-wise. And then um, I will say this film was very unexpected there is uh you think you know where this might go and they're setting you up and then they're like no never mind not at all even remotely it was in a good way it i think in the best way it could have been for this yeah like it really twists um around i know it's not a good movie it's really not (laughs) but it makes it watchable And it makes it not predictable, which I was a fan of. And you actually end up kind of almost rooting for her in moments, which is kind of cool. So that's cool. Yeah, I was I was impressed by that because the first one I was like, fuck this little girl, like punt her. I mean, this adult, (laughs) you know, just punt her all the way. Yeah, this is all based on, you know, a a true story kind of about a a woman who got who looked like a child and was adopted into a family and then... Oh, uh, no, I did not know this. Yeah, from like the 1930s or something like that. I'm never adopting. That would be a <laughs> much more interesting story. <laughs> uh, the fu? I mean, I've definitely heard of people who like like runaways and stuff who find in the paper like kids that look like them and have oh, disappeared yeah. from when they were little, little, and then yeah. inserting themselves. Like, I know that has happened, mm-hmm. but... There's a pretty no. good documentary about that. Yeah. It's really disturbing. Yeah. And wasn't that kind of one of the plot lines in that uh, Titane or t- Titane? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Well, uh, <clears throat> I did have Lord of the Rings down to talk, so I inserted a new one. Oh. Uh, House of the Dragon. Oh, oh shit. That Game of Thrones. And I wasn't too sure if I was going to watch this or not. The mm-hmm. commercials maybe. Uh, I don't know. I've watched the first three episodes now, and um, it's, it's pretty good. It's... Uh, it started off a little, I don't know what's going on here. And then by se- episode three, they pulled in all the intrigue and stuff. And you've got, a, is it Matt Smith, the Doctor Who character playing the villain of this series? Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's really good at it. And the woman they've cast as, she's supposed to, she's 15 in the m- movie, but she's like 22 or 23. Mm. She don't look it. 
<laughs> she looks, yeah, I, when they said 15, I was like, really? She's not 13? She's creepily young looking. Yeah. But uh, she's also pretty damn good and uh, carries the weight of being the new um, badass mm-hmm. woman in the series quite well. Mm-hmm. So I'm intrigued where it's going. It should be fun. I love hearing this because, so I watched the first episode just to see, you know, sure. is this something new I'll get into? And no, I, couldn't I, I, couldn't, I couldn't do it. And then I talked to our buddy Phil mm-hmm. last night, actually. And, uh, and I had said, um, I just read this review that said part two, you, the part one wasn't great, but part two brings it all in for all you uh, Game of Thrones fans. And Phil was like, part two sucked. <laughs> and I'm, I'm less interested now than I was when I started the first or this new season. Wow. And now you're saying that you're liking it a lot. So this yeah. is, this is, I mean, tell me they're doing something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, I had the opportunity to check it out as well. And, um, it's very Lord of the Rings. I'm sorry, Jesus. It's Game very of Game of Thrones. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it feels like it continues that spirit. And so if you liked Game of Thrones, then you're going to be in for a treat. And if you didn't like Game of Thrones, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I'm probably probably not. But Matt Smith is incredible. I do think actually all the actors and a lot of the characters are really interesting. So that definitely drags you through it because you're like, well, where the fuck is this going to go? And they do kind of, they seem to be leaping through time pretty regularly, which I think is healthy yeah. for this p- kind of a story. Yeah. So I you're not think- like meandering in this one moment forever. It's like, okay, no. And then like a year later or whatever. Sorry, two episodes, not three. But yeah, the second I did like the second one. Because it, it what made Game of Thrones so interesting, at least I but think overall. Sex. No, it was not the sex, it wasn't the battles, although it has probably one of the best battles I've ever seen on film anywhere with the Battle of the Bastards. Mm-hmm. But um the the it's the political intrigue, it's the the, the thrones, the game of thrones. And I think they've I think they hit that well mm. because there's a setup for what the king should do. And then the king gives in to his mm-hmm. baser reactions right. and makes the wrong choice, mm-hmm. which you can see will be on par with the execution at the end of season one of Game of Thrones, where mm-hmm. that one thing leads to all the shit that happens. Right. And I think that one choice is going to lead to all the shit that happens. I found it really satisfying to watch a show where like a a person in power, like the the king Mm -hmm. is not very good, but not in a way that it's like really drastic, like, oh, you're evil or, oh, you're awful. It's like you can see where he could have been good or might almost be good, but he's not. And that's such a subtle, interesting line to ride. Exactly. So Uh, rewinding just a bit, speaking of uh, great battle scenes, Mm -hmm. I, when, Power rings of power. When that started mm-hmm. with the kids in the stuff, I was like, "I am going to hate this." <laughs> and then the next fucking scene was the battle of the elves and the orcs oh, against geez. Morgoth's crew and all that. And I was just like, "I think I might fucking love this." Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, the kids were a little intolerable, but it's brief. It's yes. brief. Uh, and then rewriting. All the way back to last episode, I think, Eric, when you were you were talking about, I believe, um, the new Child's Play. Oh, yeah. I forgot to bring something up, and I wondered how you guys saw it. And I, hmm. I don't know if you'll remember this, Vanessa, but um, throughout the movie, they make a big point of the kid, remember, has a hearing aid. Right. Yeah. And they do nothing with that. Yeah, that was really weird. I, and mean, I, they... I mean, as a filmmaker, you know that this is here because this is going to play a part in the third act, right? Uh, it's Chekhov's hearing aid or something. Yeah, I was just thinking that exact yes, phrase. Yeah, they do like one scene or something where he can't, He, I don't remember, the movie left such an impression on me, I can't remember why. But <laughs> they did something with it, but it had nothing to do with what it should have been. Right, and and that, when I said, Vanessa, earlier when you were talking about um, the 3,000 Years of Longing, um, yeah. that had to be a studio interference thing, right? Where the writer, who seemed to know what he was doing in the beginning of that Child's Play script, right? Yeah. Uh, they didn't pay that off, and that feels like the studio came in and said, "Oh, we need this a lot bigger. Can we have explosions and fire in this or something?" And I'm sure that guy was just like, "Yeah, sure, boss." You can absolutely yeah, do that. That's so funny that you mentioned this. I have completely forgotten that was a, even a part of the plot at all. 
I just remember watching it, and that was what really pissed me off was there was something going on here, and it was not paid off. The studio <sighs> stopped them from doing yeah. what he Yes. Was. Yeah, we also talked about um, the lead, uh, Aubrey Plaza. Aubrey. Mm-hmm. She was born in 84. So she was plenty old enough to I <laughs> guess. She was like, I well, guess. she's like 33 when the movie was made. Yeah. Well, you know Having what? Having a kid not... at 20 or 21 well, is not kid... a stretch. I... <laughs> this is true. Yeah. This is true. It's not in their bit best interest to cast such a yeah. young looking no actress kidding, then man. yeah who's so smoking hot yeah i yeah i found it just uncomfortable because i'm so used to her also coming from the past roles she's played <laughs> where she's just like basically either april from um, parks and rec where she's just like a pissed off teen right. yeah. or in any of the other subsequent roles where she's completely irresponsible completely yes. not self-aware not the best mom not yeah, the no. world not a good mom just trying to scrape it together and work in a two jobs just to help her kid i also watched a uh aubrey plaza reacts to thirsty tweets oh god and she's like i'm pretty sure this is going to be a whole bunch of people just saying me they want me to run them over with my car or some crap like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she wasn't far off <laughs> correct correct so yeah that's the that's the reaction she elicits on screen is yeah. that hot woman you want to hurt you or right. something yeah <laughs> right well that's She's got a real when, Wednesday Adams uh, vibe to her. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a little break so I can cool off from all this hot Aubrey Plaza talk. <laughs> and then when we come back, we're digging into Micah's choice. Yes. Uh, which is 70s science fiction. Alpha team in danger. Code red. Lift off. This is Space 1999, Eagle One Spaceship. Off of control, we have contact. You can jettison the cockpit and engines, then link them up. It's Mini Eagle One in visual contact. Off of control, lookup is a go. And their Eagle One rescue phase is complete. Eagle One, Roger and L. Space 1999, Eagle One Spaceship comes with three inch figures. Assembly required, you from Mattel. We have returned. We're talking 70 sci-fi from Micah, who made a sizable donation to uh, choose our subgenre for us. And I'm going to start, you guys. Oh, sure. fine. I was so excited because... I mean, I you know like, Micah best, right? Yes. No way. <laughs> yes, I do. Micah and I go way back. And uh, I thought, man, what am I going to talk about? This There's so many oh, films yeah. in this subgenre that oh, I love. Yeah. I'm like, is this the time I use to talk about Logan's Run? Oh, oh. Or, or you know, any of the other ones, maybe some of the uh, Star Wars uh, ripoffs that came out immediately after, <laughs> like Star Crash or something. Yes. Uh, no, I decided to try something I've always wanted to see, and that's on me, you guys. Oh, uh, no. Uh-oh. But the 70s, it's so lush. <laughs> it's a big, beautiful field. Yeah. Well, I chose The Terminal Man. The second of the three releases is... The Terminal Man. The computer will be powered by an atomic power pack implanted in his shoulder. Starring George Siegel. Stroke number one is lateral 48.1, corona 21.5. A computer expert who agrees to undergo experimental surgery. It's like a roller coaster. Once you start it, you can't stop it. I was out. Alarm. With nightmare results. Lost him. I'm sure defense has other uses for it, if you know what I mean. Harry Benson is now the Terminal Man. 1974. Okay. I can find no budget. It had a box office of $224,542. Oh, my. Whoa. That's just U.S., but it only had a couple of disastrous U.S. showings. (laughs) So um, the Rotten Tomatoes critics have it at 53%, and the audience has it at 43%. It was based on the novel novel by Michael Crichton, who, of course, did Jurassic Park, Westworld, Timeline, all of those movies that we love. And the script was written and directed by Mike Hodges, who did Flash Gordon. Oh. he wrote and directed Damien Omen 2. He wrote The Black Rainbow. So this guy's 
a good writer, he's a good director, and I thought I was going to love this. Uh, it stars George Siegel, 129 credits, including King Rat, Roller Coaster, and 2012. Joan Hackett, lots of TV in the 60s and 70s. She was also in The Escape Artist, The Possessed, and she passed away from cancer at the very young age of 49. Wow. Damn. And then it also stars uh, Donald Moffat, 121 credits, including Earthquake, Clear and Present Danger. He played the android Rem in the Logan's Run TV series. <laughs> But he was uh, Gary, the, the boss in The Thing. John Carpenter's The Thing. Oh, the guy who yells, cool. you know, get me out of this fucking couch. <laughs> <laughs> so I read the story in uh, high school when I went through my Michael Crichton kick. And I remember really liking it. This is a very slim volume, but uh, I liked it a lot. Um, Harold Benson is a computer scientist in his mid-30s. And he has something that is called uh, psychomotor epilepsy following a car accident that he was in a few years earlier. So he gets these seizures followed by blackouts, and then he wakes up hours later with no memory of what has happened. But what has happened is he has uh, he goes into a violent rage and <laughs> beats people oh. nearly to death. Jeez. Wow. Um, when this comes up, uh, when the movie starts, he has beaten two people nearly to death on two separate occasions and was arrested beating a third one. Oh, my God. And uh, he is a prime candidate for an operation to implant an electronic brain pacemaker in his brain that is supposed to control the seizures. Oh. There is one doctor in this group of doctors who are trying to get this done, uh, Janet Ross, who is not interested in this. She's like, I do not think this is going to work. This puts the patient at risk, and I don't think it's going to have any kind of help on him because uh, through all of her research and testing with this particular guy, Harold, she's come to the conclusion that he's psychotic. So uh, it won't have any effect on his violent tendencies. Uh, she is voted over, overvoted, outvoted, and uh, the team of doctors decide to go forward with the operation. So a big chunk of this movie, this movie's kind of split into three acts. Weird, huh? Have you guys ever heard of it, such a thing? <laughs> three. But the, the problem with this is the acts are all kind of dull. Oh, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so the first act, we, we meet him and the doctors, and then it goes um, into the doctors discussing his case for a lot of this first act. They're talking about the ramifications of the surgery, and all that, and then we go into the actual surgery, which consists of uh, implanting 40 electrodes into his brain that can sense when the aura of his seizure is coming on. And that then releases a tranquilizer into his bloodstream so the anger is nullified. That's the, that's the whole kind Weird. of idea of what they're doing. He's got this little atomic battery power pack that is implanted into his shoulder, okay. and that's going to power the electrodes, all of this stuff. It's... A ton of tech and medical jargon, and that is because Michael Crichton. Yes, <laughs> exactly. True. So then, after the surgery, we go into this um, the second act, which is them doing a battery of tests on him and seeing if any of this worked. So this entire time, he's kind of he's kind of confined to this hospital, but it's not like a um, it's not like a a mental hospital or anything where he would actually be confined. It is a regular hospital and he has a cop stationed outside his room. Oh, well, that seems safe. <laughs> and it's just like, well, this, you guys are asking for something to happen with you know, this guy who budget cuts. <laughs> what, I know. What's she going to do? <laughs> so they, uh, they activate the electrodes one by one and we see how he reacts to them. And really what you start feeling is, uh, is pity for this guy because, um, she's talking to him and, uh, they're in a room by themselves, but there's a one way mirror where the other doctors are doing things and mm -hmm. she'll, she'll ask him a question and then the doctor will press a button and he'll just start crying oh, God. And, and you're like, this seems kind of cruel and unusual. Um, <laughs> because they're just, they're just putting him through all these feelings that he's not really feeling. And you can tell the doctor who's questioning him is this Janet Ross and she is very, very uncomfortable with all this. Mm -hmm. But the whole point of it is to kind of show you that she is... She's slowly being convinced that maybe this could work, that they're able to actually control his stuff. Mm. Um, but he starts going through the seizures, and then they, uh, the seizure triggers the tranquilizer, and it works on him. 
uh, but it's happening more and more often in the hospital. He's going into the seizures uh, more often than he was without the surgery. Hmm. So Dr. Ross is starting to get a little suspicious of this, and she uh, decides to to kind of, uh, I guess, interrogate him on her own, and she knows what she's looking for, and it turns out she's right. He's initiating the seizures himself oh, because shit. he's getting a shock of pleasure every time the tranquilizers happen. So oh, he's, my God. He's making the thing happen, and of course... Uh, her fear is that he's going to somehow short this out or be on constant thing. It's it's kind of a um, it's kind of a addict type of oh. uh, relationship he's got with this thing. The more he does it, the more he needs it, and he's able to get past the the pain and all this stuff Jesus. and the tranquilizers and all that. So anyway, he managed to he manages to escape, of course. <laughs> Shocking. And what? We go into this third act now. All of this stuff is kind of interesting. But that's because I'm I'm telling you in four minutes what took you know twenty minutes of each of these acts to go through, <laughs> and it's it's kind of like we could have done something else in here. <laughs> uh, finally, though, he escapes and he goes on this uh, bit of a rampage. He um, runs on uh, he runs uh, into this gal he knew before he went in, and she liked him, and so she's like, "Oh, it's been so long. Yeah, you can stay with me." And of course, he goes insane and kills her in her room. In her, pretty decent scene where she's on the waterbed waiting for him and he starts getting the seizure and he breaks the mirror and then uses a shard of the mirror to start stabbing her to death on this waterbed and he also punctures the waterbed so there's water and blood and all this stuff so so like basically the tranquilizer just isn't working anymore or he's like used it because of the addictive personality of it he's built up such tolerance to it now that it. it doesn't do anything oh interesting okay and because of his psychotic tendencies, he comes out of the seizure and um, there's very little remorse or anything for what he's done. He just realizes, well, I did it again. <laughs> right, wrong. Yep. Did I do that? Um, <laughs> sorry. sorry. So, uh, and then, of course, he's decided he's got to go after Dr. Ross, of course. Mm. So he, um, he, he hunts her down in her house and all this stuff. She does this one thing, which I thought was cool. And I'll get to why I thought it was cool, but she, uh, she, he's got her up against the, um, the kitchen counter and she, uh, whacks the microwave on and that short circuits the atomic pack in his shoulder and he goes running out in pain and all this stuff. And so, um, that is the one thing that I did like about that. There's some really interesting stuff going on in all this because it's Michael Crichton. So he's always talking about, you know, cutting edge technology in all of his books. Right. This one was written in 73. So this kind of stuff was cutting edge technology. And quite honestly, microwaves were kind of cutting edge yeah. technology. The microwave she has on her counter is the size of a refrigerator. Oh, you know? sure. <laughs> yeah, it, it makes sense. It can heat one plate in it, but it takes <laughs> up about 40 square feet. Um <laughs> So not only is the surgery cutting tech, but um, Benson, the character, is a computer scientist also, right? So mm-hmm. when he's not uh, in a psychotic rage, he's doing all these things to fuck with the people who uh, are after him, like um, getting all their personal info and oh. screwing up their bank accounts and shit like this, That's which I so imagine neat. was pretty terrifying in 1974. Yeah. We have all become used to it. We probably shouldn't be, <laughs> yeah. but this was all all quite new. Um the problem is that uh, the movie has some cool ideas. They're not executed as well as the book, and overall, it's just rather dull. There is a bizarre climax in the cemetery, which I don't remember from the book, and I'm sure it's just done as a visual thing, where he kind of um, crashes a funeral, and then Dr. Ross is trying to talk him down. And he's got a gun, and there's a helicopter with a police sniper and Jeez. all this stuff, and of course, they take him out, and he falls in the uh, grave that was open. Which I imagine is horrifying for the poor family that were actually going to bury someone they loved in it, who are all standing around while this is going on. So, like, we paid good money for this hole. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Put the coffin on top of that asshole. Oh, God. <laughs> Squish him down. It is a great shot, though, of um, looking up from the grave, and all these cops show up, and it is a it is a weird scene because the cops look like something out of uh, THX 1138. The way it's oh. shot, they're wearing face masks that are all reflective and, and mm. stuff like that. And I, I was like, there's there's something else going on in this movie. And I'll get into that too. But um, <laughs> the tagline is, 
Harry Benson is a, is, uh, <clears throat> let me start over, take two. Sure. Harry Benson is a brilliant computer scientist. For three minutes a day, he is violently homicidal. Ooh. Well, you might just schedule yourself around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some trivia. Michael Crichton was fired from writing the screenplay due to the fact that his script did not follow the novel, which he had written close enough. Oh, my God. That's, <laughs> That's beautiful. <wild. laughs> my guess is he was like, listen, I'm going to change a few things around, guys. Technology is moving fast and all this. And they were like, hey, we bought a book and we want that book. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, during the surgery, which is being done in a bunch of students, you've seen this kind of scene where they're on the operating table and then they've got the, uh, the students oh, yeah. up above looking through windows and everything. There is a voice that is commenting on the whole thing and telling the students what's going on. Um, the man who's doing that is Jason Wingreen, best known for being the voice of Boba Fett in <laughs> Star Wars Episode Five: The Empire Strikes Back. Whoa. Wow. He's no good to me dead. Is that what he sounded like <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> announcing the surgery? <laughs> Um, so this is the weirdest thing. Okay. There is a bizarre scene where, um, Benson is rifling through a closet and there is a radio playing on the, on the dresser next to it. Mm. And what it is playing is an advertisement for Scientology. <laughs> and this advertisement <laughs> okay. for Scientology plays over the whole scene. It's like two minutes long. Oh it is God. a full advertisement for Whoa. Scientology. And at first I thought, are they making some kind of comment about Scientology? Because it's, it's a real advertisement, and it's very strange. But then I was like, look, any publicity is good publicity. This had to have been put in by one of the filmmakers who thought, you know, oh, we'll just... Listen, you guys, I've joined this new church, <laughs> and I'd love if everybody here on set wanted to join it. I'm just going to play this little radio ad, and oh you guys God. make it up for yourself. But... uh Take this personality test. Yeah. <laughs> See good. how many Therones you've got in your body, maybe. That's right. You guys heard of the Thetans? <laughs> Live in the middle of the planet? No? <laughs> uh, so I thought it was really strange. I did some research on it. There's very little talk about it, probably because Scientology clamps down very hard on any conversation about Scientology. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only things that are really being said are in, like... Um, uh, film forums, you know, nerds that are going, this film is a, uh, is a Scientology propaganda film because at the very end there, it's bookmarked by these two weird scenes of like an eye hole in a cell opening up and an oh. eye looking in and then somebody talking in the first scene where it happens at the beginning of the film, you think they're talking to Benson, but it happens after he's dead. The eye hole opens up and there's an eye and a guy says something like, um, uh, what are you looking at? They're coming for you next. And closes. And I was like, what? what? <laughs> the heck? Wow. It's a very strange film. I did. I'm happy I saw it. No need to ever watch it again. But um, I don't know. Just a very strange, strange film all around. Huh, sounds like it. <laughs> Thanks, Micah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's... Um... That that's gonna be a hard act to follow. That just sounds like it has so many very fun twists and turns. But uh, I love that like weird use of technology. Um, so I went with a film that uh, Micah actually suggested to me. Oh wow! Alrighty. So I I thought you know what you know gave an awesome donation, really good fan, uh, good friend. Sure, why not? So I went with the 1977 film Capricorn One. The most important event in recent history. What if it never really happened? We found out two months ago it won't work. You guys would all be dead in three weeks. What if man's greatest technological achievement was a multi-billion dollar fraud? Something's wrong, something big. They know I'm onto it and they try to kill me. This is Capricorn One. <laughs> All we've got to do is get to any city, any place there are people. The only way that truth can come out is if they live long enough to tell us. How do we know this hasn't already happened? How do we know it won't happen again? Capricorn One, rated PG. 
Uh, you mean the documentary Capricorn? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I have notes on that. <laughs> hey, there you go. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Have you both seen it then? It's not for a while, but yeah. I saw it just recently again, so I. Oh, did you? <laughs> fresh in your mind. Um, so this has a Rotten Tomato score of sixty-two percent from critics and fifty-eight percent from audience. Um, the budget was actually. A pretty low for a film like this. It was considered to be an independent movie, and it was just under five million, considering what the film is. Box office of twelve million, uh, at least. It was um, directed and written by Peter Himes. Uh, so you would know him from twenty-five different things, including Running Scared, Time Cop, The Relic, End of Days, and The Musketeer. Um, also starring, um, a couple, I'll kind of go through some of the, the leads here, uh, but there are a lot of people in this movie, but I am too young, I guess, <laughs> to know who they are. I just can tell from the way the camera lingers that they're famous. Well, you know, at least one of them. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Elliot Gould, um, is probably huh? the, the, biggest name maybe at this point mm, maybe not um uh, he plays a reporter uh he's been in 193 things Whoa. including uh the film mash uh oceans 11 movies he was in the long goodbye he was in the player he also plays jack geller um which is the geller's dad in <laughs> friends and he he does a lot of stuff he does like yeah. three to five films a year he's just I didn't. I couldn't even like parse through his IMDb because there was just so much stuff. Um, also starring James Brolin, who is one of three astronauts. Uh, he's kind of the lead astronaut, Brew Baker. He's been in 141 things, including Westworld, um, Amityville Horror. He was in 115 episodes of something called Hotel, which I do not know, and 170 episodes of Marcus Welby, MD. I also do not know. Uh, Sam Waterston in the, uh, is in this, and he plays uh, the third, uh, the second astronaut, Peter Willis. He's been in 379 episodes of Law and Order <laughs> as DA go. Jack McCoy. So you would probably know him from that. If you don't know him from that, 94 episodes of Grace and Frankie, where he is one of the leads, or 25 episodes of The Newsroom, or Ser Serial Mom. So you choose. Um, and uh, last but not least, the third astronaut is played by one O.J. Simpson. Um, he has 36 credits to his name, including the Naked Gun movies. He was in Towering Inferno. He was in 67 episodes of something called First and Ten. And he's also known for definitely not murdering his wife. So <laughs> He starred in an amazing long-running courtroom drama in the mid, early to mid-90s. Yeah, we all <laughs> tuned in for that. Um, also, uh, in it, there's Hal Holbrook, Karen Black, David Huddleston, Brenda Vaccaro. There's just a lot of people who come and go. Um, the plot. So we start off in this big, big mission that's underway. It's, it's launch day, and there's a ton of fanfare and excitement. Um, mission Control is calling out a play-by-play -play of what's happening. Like, the astronauts ate this for lunch, and uh, so-and-so is this, and the blood pressure is this, and now we're moving into this area. So there's kind of narrating what's happening as you're seeing it. Uh, the press is in attendance to watch this launch. Um, in kind of the small uh, stadium seating area, including the vice president of the United States. Um, there are three astronauts, uh, Brubaker, Willis, and Walker, who are doing the very, like, American walking down the, the runway. Everyone's like, oh, yeah. The you right guys. stuff. Yeah. Very right <laughs> stuff. Countdown has started. Um, they get they get into the the what is it the ship <laughs> and, <laughs> and an engine they're joking around with the the crew and an engineer gives them a special gift and they're like okay well, we're going to take this with us um and this is a, a mission to mars so this is going to be the first manned mission to mars um they close up countdown's going they're all buckled in they're pressing all the buttons and knock 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 <laughs> somebody's at the window <laughs> and they're like uh what they open it they go, get out now. And they're like, what? No. And he's no, no, get out now. Don't ex doesn't explain anything. So that all three of them, you know, pile out and uh, we get this kind of cross cutting between like the countdown and everyone excited about the rocket going off and the astronauts going down a hallway 
the astronauts <laughs> getting on a bus, the astronauts getting on a plane. And as they're like off in the air, um, the uh, rocket, the spaceship takes off and, you know, everyone's like, oh, yeah, clapping, clapping, clapping. And it's like, what the actual fuck is happening? <laughs> so uh, they are taking to an abandoned military base in the desert. And there, Callaway, who's kind of the head of the mission to Mars, tells them that there was a, a faulty problem with the rocket. The life support system would have killed them very early into the flight. Um, it was made cheaply and ineffectively. And so if he left them there, they would have died. However... If they canceled the mission, America's waning interest uh, would in in space exploration would result in the as a death nail into the NASA um, space missions and probably the program as a whole. So he begs them to help him keep the dream of space alive uh, by faking a live recording of the Mars landing on a set that they've made and by doing a public. Um, space to family phone call uh, months later when they're supposed to be calling their family as they're returning to earth. They are pretty torn and like, <laughs> what the hell? This is a bad idea. And they're really hemming and hawing about this, even though he's giving like the speech of his life. Um, and then he's like, well, okay, but I, I didn't want to mention it. It's not me who did this, but somebody did this, but your, your wives and families are on a plane right now. And there's a device on the plane. And if you say no, the device will go off <laughs> and your families will die. Uh, so they agree to do it. Months pass. They are just hanging out in this base, wasting time, <laughs> waiting to do a big fake live recording. We actually uh, hear their voices, though, giving feedback um, to Mission Control about how everything's going and checking in, talking about how the instruments are doing. Uh, they had been pre-recorded during test flights, and the and NASA is playing it back to NASA. So no one else knows what is happening. Um Everything is going pretty smoothly until one technician notices there's a problem with the signal. It doesn't appear to be coming from space, <laughs> but maybe somewhere on Earth. And he's not sure that he thinks his um, equipment is faulty until he brings it to Callaway's attention. And Callaway is like, shut up and do your job. And he's like, <laughs> well... That's a weird reaction rather than being like, I'll send an engineer. Uh, so he starts complaining it about this sort of thing that happened to him at work. It was so weird to his dear friend Caulfield, which is played by Elliot Gould. Um, and his friend happens to be a reporter. They're playing pool and uh, he's you know bitching about this weird thing that happened. And Caulfield's like, huh, sounds like a tough day, man. Um, Caulfield gets a phone call about something. He, then he comes back to the pool game and dude is gone just gone and so he's like what the heck happened so he calls the dude no one answers the phone phone number does not exist he goes to the apartment where his friend lives there's a woman living there um she's got a bunch of mail uh that has her name on it with the addresses there are records showing that she has lived there for months uh when he calls his job no one has ever heard of him this technician does not exist caulfield is suspicious uh, the more he digs in uh, to try and figure out what's happened, all of a sudden um, things are trying to kill him. Uh, so his car breaks down, starts speeding up to like a zillion miles per hour. And he's trying it's a big scene of him trying to not crash into things and weave and swerve and his brakes not working. And then, of course, he goes off a bridge into the water. So easily survives, apparently. Um, someone tries to shoot him. The police uh, plant drugs on him, try to arrest him. Um, and the deeper he gets into what is happening here, the worse it gets. Meanwhile, the big day arrives for the men to fake their landing on Mars. It's uh, being recorded live. So the way that they get around the sort of um, difference in atmosphere is when they like jump off the ladder, there is a team there that's slow mowing it as they like slowly <laughs> land onto the ground, even though in real life they just hop. Uh, so it's nice to kind of see the inner cutting of like what te what America is seeing and what the world is seeing versus what they're doing. And they are just so not into it. And then, of course, uh, when they get to the phone call scene where they have to call their families, they they just are like, well, fuck, OK, I guess I'm going to do this. But Brubaker, the lead astronaut of the mission, is more and more feeling like this is wrong. And so he says something strange to his wife during the phone call that really perplexes her. Uh 
Caulfield also notices that there is a strange thing that happened because of the way her face contorts and he's a reporter and he's there to report on it. He's like, hmm, something weird is going on here too. So finally, over a year later, the mission is meant to land. By the way, I think we're about halfway into the film at this point. On the way in for the rocket... A heat shield. I know. It's okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. But on the way in, the heat shield for the rocket, uh, the spaceship malfunctions and the rocket blows up. So all three astronauts are put into a holding area because they were supposed to get flown to an island where it's then like they're going to like swim out to the thing and be like, oh, yeah, we were we made it. and We're happy to be home. Um, so while waiting to figure out what is going on, uh, they realize they're about to get killed. Because there's no way NASA is going to let this leak. <laughs> so what they what NASA doesn't know is that these are highly trained astronauts who are physically fit and mentally fit, and they know how to break out of a room. So they sure do. And then, of course, they're astronauts, so they know how to fly a plane. So they sure do fly a plane. Uh, the, the plane runs out of gas, they end up in the desert, and they decide to go in three different directions to try and blow NASA off. So... The big question, will they escape? Will Caulfield work out what happens and show up in the nick of time? Will there be a dust cropper plane chase versus black op style NASA helicopters through the desert with a man hanging off the side? Who knows? Will it end in the literal most ridiculous way possible? And also on a freeze frame? Hmm, hard to say. It is ridiculous. Um, so some thoughts on this. Uh, I think somebody had a goddamn ball writing this movie. They were just <laughs> loving life. I mean, the number of inspirational speeches where you're like genuinely touched and moved is high. I'd say that's like uh, 25 to 30 percent of the film is just <laughs> inspirational speeches. Wow. It's really strongly well written dialogue. One of the astronauts is always joking around, and that's really fun. Elliot Gould's character of the reporter as uh, this kind of a cad who, like, is not a great reporter but thinks he is. He's a really fun character. There's just a lot of really good, strong writing in this. There's a lot of um, quippy back and forths. Uh, the boss of the reporter hates him, and so they have this sort of mile-a-minute back and forth as to, like, uh, you got to let me follow this lead. Um, and I saw it in a movie once. You're supposed to give me 48 hours. And the, the boss is like, I saw that same movie. It's 24 hours. I don't want to <laughs> give it to you, but get the hell out of here. So there's a lot of little great moments like that. It is weird seeing Elliot Gould as the hot young guy. I haven't seen a lot oh. of movies with him yeah. as younger. So it was a little strange, but that's fine. I mean, he pulls it off. He's Elliot Gould. I definitely not in my brain seared as like grandfatherly. Um, there's really good cross cutting and editing happening in here between different moments. So when the astronauts are working out what's going to happen to them now that the uh, spaceship has exploded, and then we're cutting to Callaway making this speech about, you know, America has lost these great astronauts today. And like, they're just really showing like, okay, I bet he's going to say this now. And then he says that exact thing and he's going to do this now. And then that exact thing happens. It's really strong. Um, it is funny to me that in this film, no one can kill Elliot Gould, no matter how hard they try, <laughs> which is not as hard as they could. At one point, they drive by and shoot at him, and he has to duck to live. And I'm like, why don't they just keep shooting? He's on the ground. He's in the middle of nowhere. It'd be easy. You just walk out of your car. You've got <laughs> at least three more bullets in there. Will not take much. He is a large target. I'm like, you guys are not trying very hard at this. I am sorry, but um, it's really your own fault, whatever happens in this film. Um, there is some really cool rear slash front slash um, interesting projected um, stunt work slash plane shooting where there's a chase plane sequence. And it is really neatly shot, especially considering they have a guy hanging off one of the wings. Like it is just really well done you feel it it's, there's a lot of tension and excitement um and they do a really good job considering you know it's like there's is that really a guy on there i don't know and um there is uh <laughs> however the ending y'all okay so you know when they're trying to make dramatic moments in the 70s and their answer is to put it in slow motion mm -hmm. and then they cut back to the scene 
and then back to the slow motion. But now the slow motion is slower. And let's say you do this five <laughs> yeah. times yeah. back and forth until it is so slow. At one point, Elliot Gould is running and he's got his tongue between his teeth. And I'm just like, that tongue will never make it back in his mouth. And he looks like a goofball. <laughs> and then I'm like, well, they have to finish the story. No, no, they just freeze frame. And I'm like, are we out? I guess we are out of this film. So that is definitely the weakest part of this whole movie. Um, a little bit of trivia. Uh, Peter Hames began thinking about this film uh, of a space hoax when working on broadcasts of the Apollo mission for CBS. He later reflected regarding the Apollo 11 moon landing. There was one event of really enormous importance that had almost no witnesses. And the only verification we have came from a TV camera. <laughs> so Hames wrote the script in 1972, but no one wanted to make it. He says it was a uh, greenlit after the Watergate scandal. Um, <laughs> and so he made a deal to do it for 4.8 million um, to stay within budget. NASA's cooperation was absolutely needed. There was uh, one of the, I think the producer had a good relationship with the space agency from working on future world. Um, the filmmakers were thus able to obtain government equipment as props. And despite the negative portrayal of the space agency, um, it did include a uh, prototype of the Apollo lunar module. I bet NASA regrets that now. Um, <laughs> it was shot out in Red Rock Canyon State Park. Uh, one of the stunt pilots, Frank Tolman, who flew the Red Stearman plane, said it was the most dangerous and complex aerial sequence ever executed for a movie. Ironically, wow. he was killed in a crash soon after filming finished. Oh, um, director Peter Hames admitted the studio mandated him to cast O.J. Simpson. However, he thought he was a charming, terrific guy. Uh, <laughs> this became the year's most successful independent movie. Two novelizations of the film were written uh, after this by separate authors. One was for the U.S. and one was for the U.K. They are very similar, except for following uh, a few things regarding the reporter. Uh, the film ignited a bit of a frenzy behind the moon landing conspiracy. People who were kind of thinking, oh, maybe that might be a thing. Once they saw this movie, were like, it's scientifically credible. And they were sure, sure, it had to be true. Um, clips were used by from this film for Fox TV show Conspiracy Theory. And in 2020 to 2021, somewhere in there, it was used as an internet prank where someone recut the fake Mars landing scene and posted it on social media platforms with the headline, WikiLeaks releases moon landing cut scene filmed in Nevada desert. <laughs> WikiLeaks released no such video. Um, and as IMBD was sure to tell me that anytime um, a spacecraft has flown past the moon, including when China did, and took photos of the moon, you do still see their equipment and flag on there. So there you go, guys. Um, yeah, this movie really put a dent in uh, conspiracy theory land, but. Sure. I like this movie quite a bit. Uh, this is not science fiction. The only reason I let this slide is because the person <laughs> who donated suggested you watch this movie. <laughs> a fictional story and it revolves around oh, well, science. I'm not even sure it's fictional. Let's not go there. Oh my god. <laughs> you can't. No. No. I thought no. that um, Kelly will be taking us on his quest. Why the earth is flat. That's right. On our next episode. <laughs> Wait That's until right. you get to the edge, guys. Wait until you get to the edge. Then you'll see. I thought that um, why is his name escaping me? The lead astronaut. Uh, oh, um, James Brolin? James Brolin. Oh was maybe never more handsome than he is in this film. He is great in this film. He, <laughs> he looks is, awesome. He is just uh, like the the prototypical mm, yeah. good-looking handsome movie star. Yeah. So I can 100%. see why I think my mom had quite a crush on James Brolin. <laughs> yeah. Um I I didn't get out of it. I got that you respected this film. Did you like it? I did. I really liked it, except for the ending. But I, I really did like it all the way through. It was fast-paced. It was interesting. I love the way that um, Berlin's character navigates all the problems he gets into and like just figures out how to uh, escape or, or deal with these different things that happen. I thought it was very smart and fun because normally you're like, oh, they get caught. Oh, oh you did the stupid <laughs> thing. Oh. But he does like, the smartest possible thing in every moment. And you're like, yeah. You do work for NASA, don't you? 
Uh, <laughs> remind me what year this came out? 1977. 77. Oh, wow. So um, what's interesting, man, I'm going to sound like such a huge nerd on this particular episode. Yeah, yeah. you got the Lord of the Rings, and now? We had, um, we had such a science fiction thing going in the mid-60s. Flash Gordon and stuff like that was still pretty popular. All this stuff yeah. came to a crashing halt when we landed on the moon. Yeah. yeah. Because it was just, it was like, oh, it's just a rock. <laughs> and uh, this, the space race, NASA and everything, they really felt that blow because all interest in pushing into Mars right. was just completely lost after that when we realized, oh, there's really probably nothing else out here. Mm -hmm. Uh so it took, um, I wonder what month this came out, but it took Star Wars kind of igniting everybody on space again to get NASA back into a place where they could get funds mm -hmm. for going back out into space again. Yeah, and I think they do a really beautiful job of explaining that exact thing where he's talking about, like, you know, all this money went into the moon landing, and then after that, like, and the president showed up and gave a phone call and whatever, and then he's like, and then the next one... You know, like people, you know, the next mission, like people were like, you know, stopped watching whatever. And then the next one, people complained because it, the thing in her, in the, the, whatever the space mission Breaking was. Special news bulletin. Yeah. Like yeah. interfered with reruns of I Love Lucy. And he's like, and then the president didn't come to this event. The vice president came to this event. And he's <laughs> explaining how like they're in such dire straits. However, it is weird to see that versus NASA has all these like agents running around and like helicopters they can deploy. And I'm like, <laughs> where is this like NASA money and power coming from? I mean, now it's very laughable, yeah. but it's, it was a really uh, interesting way to view them. I would say, you know, I gave a pass on them driving by him in the desert and only taking a couple of shots and then going, you know, oh, keep going because these guys were, you know, pencil pushers before they were sent out to kill this guy. <laughs> yeah, but then they've got the police like in their pocket. And I'm like, how does NASA have the local police in their pocket? What is happening? <laughs> like, Yeah, good stuff. I, I like this movie a lot. It's a fun movie. And I will say like that. Yeah, the stunts are amazing. And there's little details in here. Um, the guy who's hanging onto the side of the plane, there's a wire and he's holding onto the plane so tight as it's like, you know, doing loop-de-loops and whatever that his hand starts bleeding and you just feel for him. You're like, little things like that make a movie sing. That's very cool. Yeah, but about all I remember from Capricorn 1 is that video you're talking about that somebody recut and put on the internet. Mm. I, know, I, I remember these scenes from the movie Capricorn 1, <laughs> but uh, not much more. So it sounds like that's worth a revisit, though. Yeah. Did you, was this Prime or? Um, yeah, but I did have to pay for it. Oh, okay. So I think it was like two or three bucks. Yeah, I was going to say it's probably. <laughs> it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't $2. crazy $2. pricey. It was, it was fine. Well. We're going to slow it down a little bit here, folks. Welcome to the later hours of this show. <laughs> We're going to take you on a two-hour and 45-minute journey into 1972's Solaris. Based on the novel by Stanislav Lem. Accepted, Kelvin, or you are lost. Let 
death take you with us to Solaris, planet of mystery, embodiment of man's latent conflict with the unknown. Man, face to face with his conscience and with his past. Directed by Andrei Tarkovsky, who gave us the classic film Andrei Rublev. A studio must film production. Yes. Well, the Rotten Tomatoes one on this one was probably significantly different than Terminal Man. It was a 92 from the critics and an 89 from the crowd. Wow. An estimated budget of a million dollars. Uh, boy, did they make that stretch. <laughs> this is a long film. Uh, the box office, Scorcher. The U.S. had made twenty-two thousand dollars oh. worldwide. It made one hundred and thirty-five thousand. Oh, oh man. God! That was just playing an art house. Yeah, theater, so. <laughs> and not very many of them. I mean, I assume it's fine because it's what like Russian money. Like they they don't care, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> directed by Andrea Tarkovsky, who uh, directed Mirror, The Steamroller, and The Violin, and uh, Stalker, which I think still maintains is my favorite one from him. Uh, written by Stanslow Lem from, well, based on Stanslow Lem's novel, Solaris. Uh, written by Friedrich uh, Gornstein, who wrote The Seventh Bullet, House with a Turret. And, of course, Tarkovsky, who's involved in the writing of most everything he does. But he also wrote Sour Grapes and Beware, Snakes! <laughs> that I want to see. <laughs> badger, 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 badger. <laughs> Starring uh, Natalia uh, Bondarechik, The Mystery of Snow Queen, and Bambi's Childhood. <laughs> that sounds incredible. <laughs> Both of those. Uh, Donatos Bayanonis, who's in Anna, of course. You know, it's a Russian actor, so of course he's in a movie with the name Anna. And Zagon and Ma, Mama, I'm Alive. And Yuni Yorvet, who's uh, King Lear, uh, Terror of the Prince of Darkness. A fairy tale told at night. There are not a lot of people in this movie. Mm. <laughs> Half a dozen, maybe. So the film starts off with actually a really nice shot of uh, reeds in a water and a uh, man standing by kind of looking at them and pulling back to a large field filled with fog and uh, really haunting, beautiful. Reminded me a lot of some of the stuff he shot in Mirror. Um, there's a group of people here. They're trying to understand a message from a com that a com cosmonaut has brought back from Solaris. So they're looking at an old tape. So they're watching a VHS tape, kind of, sort of, mm. very technically different looking than what a VHS was. Remember, this is 1972. Um, the video is the cosmonaut trying to describe what happened when they viewed Solaris. And they have some footage of it, and it sort of looks like a very weird ocean. He said there's plants and fog uh, and s recognizable ele elements. But uh, he believes what he found was not a dead planet, but a living creature. Um, so, of course, the council immediately thinks he's hallucinating and made this all up. <laughs> and, uh, well, the crew members, have dis he gets dismissed and kind of kicked away. So they want to bring in Chris, who is... A psychologist. We're going to send a psychologist into space. Again, very 1972. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the main man, Burton, saw the life and thinks the man, he's a friend of Chris's, so he's kind of talking him into hopefully believing him. Um, but, you know, he's not sure. He's not a space guy. But it looks like he's going to have an interesting time doing this. They also have uh, interesting technology shown in this film where the Burton leaves and he calls Chris basically on a driving FaceTime phone call. Hmm. So they're talking. He calls him and the phone rings on the guy's TV. So he answers it on the TV. It's like a little FaceTime. After this is an interesting display in interpreting art house films. The next scene, after he hangs up, you follow Burton driving through what is Japan for a long, long time. I mean, it seems like it's four or five minute long of him just driving through 
the city. So I'm thinking, what is like, is he trying to convey the technology of the time has been taken over by the Japanese and is also really, 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 really big cities because it turns from day to night while he's driving. It's a long scene. That's a possible theory. Here's another theory that sounds, after I read it, go, God damn it. Yeah, that's probably what it was. The uh, scene is so long, probably because it's really expensive to shoot in Japan. And they wanted this scene in the movie to justify that shot of being in Japan. Going, yeah, okay, fine. Mm. <laughs> movie interpretation is a weird goddamn thing. So they send him up into space. This is 45 minutes of the movie so far. Uh, which is interesting because reading and all the things I've ever seen on Solaris never talk about the first 45 minutes. Nope. I did not realize it started on Earth and he was sent <laughs> off. I thought he was on Solaris and shit went down. Mm. But no, he is sent there. So when he arrives on the planet, you don't really see any kind of a ship. Um, you see him approaching the space station, but you'd never see whatever he is traveling in very well. Um Partially because uh, Tchaikovsky just didn't give a shit about the space technology. That was not his interest in this story. He you know, had a little bit of fun in the beginning with some weird technology, but that's it. When he arrives on the space station, there's nobody to greet him, which I think seems a little strange, considering there's only like three people, it's supposed to be three people on the station. He runs into the first guy who seems to be fairly lost and confused. Um, he tells Chris to go, you know what, just go. Freshen up, rest for a while. We'll talk in the morning. Um, and the the space station of this one is really interesting in that it looks fairly different than a lot of space station. I mean, it's 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 got the white and it's got the silver, but then there's lots of colors too. And there, it looks maybe a little more practical than some space stations have looked as opposed to looking cool for camera. Except when he arrives, it's obviously something's wrong because there's wires disconnected everywhere. There's electrical. He turns off electrical current that's going and the psychologist knows, you know, this shouldn't be happening and turns some switch. The He heads off, though, to explore the station. Of course, unsurprisingly, this film is often compared to 2001. Space Odyssey. Um, he, he claims to have not, Tchaikovsky claims to have not seen it before shooting Solaris. When he did see it, he said, eh, very sterile. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> uh, Chris begins to see a woman in the station, which there aren't supposed to be any women uh, alive left on Solaris at this point. So it's not too sure what he saw. And then he, after he realizes who it is, it's his dead wife. And it's like, um, hello. <laughs> <laughs> the interactions are very odd because she does not seem to have any clue who he is. And she is a representation of his wife who died 10 years previous. But she looks like his wife, not yes. like someone who works on the station. Right. Yep. She okay. looks like his wife. Okay. Um, mix some connective tissue or something. I don't know if he, it drove him so insane to spend the night with her, but the next morning he wakes up and says, well, we're going to get into this little spaceship and go down to the planet's surface. And she says, great. So he pushes her into the launch thing, but then he closes the door and launches her into space. <laughs> As you do. <laughs> Mike, oh, all right. That next day, the doctor who he'd talked before previously came up and asked him, so hallucinating anything? Have you seen some strange things? Uh, and this is apparently much more graphically portrayed in the book where a hallucination would come up and the doctor would beat the person to death after they realized what was going on. It's just some weird thing. Oh, my God. So they were able to physically interact with these hallucinations? Yes. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Full on flesh and bone and bleed and all that creepy shit. Um the night that night after he launches her into space, she's back. She appears again. Uh, he's trying to figure out what's going on, but the remaining men in the station seem to are trying to fill him in, but they're obviously kind of vague, and it's sort of like what? There's a scene in there that I'm going. Would that have just explained the entire movie? Because <laughs> one of his best friend, that was, or of the people there, the guy he knew the best, had killed himself, but he left a video. 
And at one point, he's watching the video, and he says, now let me explain what you're going to need to worry about. And then something happens that he turns off the video and never returns to it. <laughs> Damn it. Um, I mean, you know, shit's going down, so I guess he didn't have TV time. But still, it's like, that seems like something important for you to watch. So there's a lot of wild speculation as to what these people are. Is it alien life trying to get to know them? Is it some kind of a reproduction? Uh, most of the movie is a study in a lot of ways of dealing with loss and the strange circumstances of being human. Uh, there's a really long, powerful scene where uh, the remaining people and his wife, who is still there in physical form, are talking about um, what might be going on. What, sh what is she? What is the thing? And there's a, a story behind... So you know she's not human partially because she can't sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's not she doesn't want to, she just doesn't know how. Mm -hmm. And there's a really interesting scene at the end of this. There's a quick, quick moment where she's kind of upset. So she grabs a glass of water and tries to drink it, but it just spills out of her mouth, mm -hmm. which sends her into a really strong reaction of being very sad and upset. It's like, wow, she doesn't know how to drink. Mm -hmm. So, but she knows that's something a human does when they're stressed. It's like, fuck, man, this is, this is some deep shit. <laughs> so the, the most of the movie is, does she exist only because he perceives her? Is a belief of resistance the only reason she's on the space station? Um, the, there's a great line in the movie that I remembered that stuck out, said, uh, don't turn your scientific problem into a love story. Hmm. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it at that because talking about this film, it's not a plot driven movie. This isn't, well, this happens and this happens kind of film at all. Much like, much like 2001. It's very unusual. There's a lot of weird shit. There's strange stuff going on. Things that are not explained, but are interesting. Um, it's, I'm very curious now to see the Soderbergh version. Kind of hmm. curious what he did. It's apparently like an hour shorter. So that's nice. <laughs> what is the running time on this movie? Do you know? Almost three hours. Okay. Just under three hours. And uh, there are times that moves really quickly. Mm -hmm. And there are times it does not. <laughs> mm -hmm. And this is just on HBO. HBO Max, the whole thing. Plus the other one is as well. Um, this, but this guy's no George Clooney. I tell you, this is a, like, <laughs> this is sort of like a sitcom husband and wife situation. Did Clooney direct the one that he's in? Uh, Soderbergh. Soderbergh. Yeah. Soderbergh mm -hmm. so. oh, I'm kind of curious, I guess. Yeah. yeah, a little bit. I'm curious what they did with it. Uh, so the taglines, let us take you with us to Solaris, planet of mystery, embodiment of man's latent conflict with the unknown man face to face with his consciousness and with his past. That's a long tagline, yo. Yeah. <laughs> the other one's much shorter. For truth and courage. <laughs> oh, sure. That should be on, like, a bottle of alcohol. Yes. I was just going to say, that <laughs> makes no sense. No, it doesn't. And after having the C movie, it still makes no sense. <laughs> uh, so this is his, Tchaikovsky's wi most widely seen movie by a fairly large margin. But uh, especially outside the Soviet Union. Tchaikovsky himself reported... That it's the but it's the least favorite of the films he's made. Really, he didn't think much of it. No, uh, Stanislaw Lamb, the writer of the novel, a scathing adaptation of his novel, did not like it at all and complained that he did not write it about people's erotic problems in space. <laughs> <laughs> Huge misstep. <laughs> That's right. Although this is a German-Russian production, the film was shot in uh, Japan. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, oh. Minato, Japan. Apparently a lot of films have been shot there. Huh. The film is listed in the official top 250 narrative feature films on Letterboxd. <laughs> so it's well reviewed on Letterboxd. Tchaikovsky's rejected. And this is, I, I read this before watching the movie and it made it really an interesting way to watch the film. Because boy, is it true. Tchaikovsky rejected Eisenstein's montage and developed a kind of demanding long take aesthetic which he thought was a better way to reveal deeper truths underlining the ethereal performing moment. And boy, he does long takes. Mm -hmm. That is no kidding, man. It is long, wild takes. Some are, and sometimes absolutely works, or most of the time works, but a lot of times, like, okay, you can, you can cut now. I was really interested in the use of color in this film because 
the memories aren't necessarily black and white. They're sort of blue, black and white. Um, and there are also moments where everything's green, like a green sheen mm. and other films where it is flat black and white. Uh, the ship, like I said, is almost all white, but it has these bright splashes of reds and other colors that is kind of unusual looking for space station movies. So I kind of maybe have to delve a little deeper to find out what he was doing with the color because it's such a glaring difference. It's very obviously a choice. So it's like, so why did he make that choice? And at this point, I hadn't really found anybody saying Marsh Beyond, uh, well, the black and white represents the past. Yeah, I got that. What else, though? Because it's not just black and white. Why does it go blue? Why does it go green? Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, anyways. So Jay Cox of Time Magazine calls the effects are scanty. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> the drama gloomy. The philosophy of the film thick as a cloud of ozone. The plot is not at all that original either. Now, this is a modern review. And I'm going to take um. all modern reviewers to task on one thing. If you're watching a movie from 1972 about a space station yeah. and a ethereal entity that they're trying to figure out, by now, yeah, that's not very original. In 1972, it's been done in different ways before, but it's also still kind of new. Yeah. You know, like uh, criticizing um, Bay of Blood. Well, it's just people stalking in a in forest. Yeah, I know. You've seen that 10,000 times since then. But guess what? When Bay of Blood was done, that was a new thing. <laughs> so you're not fooling anybody by going, well, it was just so unoriginal. Mm. Let's see. Solaris ha and Chris Barsanti uh, said it's a haunted ode to lost love, and Solaris has few equals in all of cinema. Damn. This is an interesting film. Uh, that reviewer said something about the effects. So do you see the space station and what yeah, does that look like? A little bit. It looks like a Painting 1972 or... pre star Wars floating. That's a miniature. miniature. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's surprising me a little bit. Yeah. Hmm. Although the, the ocean that they use to represent when they show Solaris is oddly interesting looking. I couldn't, at times it looked like it was an ocean. At times it looked like it was something else. Like hmm. they, I don't know if they like dish soap or something in a large pool. It just looked very interesting. So I thought that was kind of cool. A bunch but... of fabric with two guys on the side yeah. of the camera. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the effects were not the thing for this film, uh, which makes it kind of an interesting sci-fi movie because it's not about space. It's not about this planet. It's about humans interacting with the unknown and weird shit going on and how we deal with it as people. So it's, it's, a, it's an art film. But it's a, a smart one. It's really well acted. Um, it's one of those movies you watch and you're kind of like, well, I don't know if I'm too interested in this. But by the end, you find yourself thinking about it two or three days later. Mm. And I that's my favorite kind of movie where it's like, even if I hate it, if it <laughs> sticks in my head two or three days later, I'm going, well, oh, fuck, there's something going on there. <laughs> like the Child's Play one we were talking about earlier. Can't even remember for sure if they did something with this hearing aid. Why? Because I really didn't give a shit about that film two days later. Sure. Right. Yeah. But, uh, wow. So, yeah, thank you. I'll thank you to Mike on that one because this has been on my to watch list for a very long time. I'm I'm so delighted you chose this movie. So I, I saw it, um, I think, for cheap at Prince Charles Cinema in London. Oh, cool. And randomly, I didn't know anything about it. I just walked oh, in and sat down and I was like... If I hadn't seen it in the theater, there's no way I would have made it through that movie. Mm -hmm. But being forced to sit there and pay attention and be just let it wash over you. By the end, it was at that point my favorite film of all time. Oh, so, wow. yeah, like I'm I'm so excited that I'm, I want to rewatch it just yeah. based off of you talking about it. It hit me in a very weird way because of, of physical mm -hmm. Uh, I was watching this in my office, which is the hottest room in our house, mm -hmm. and it got so hot, oh I God. felt <laughs> otherworldly almost, and I'm watching <laughs> yeah. this weird-ass otherworld movie. I'm like, I think I need to take a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> a glass of water. A glass yes. of water. No, I stuck my head in the shower. Oh, <laughs> good. that far. It's like, nope. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> was, well, yeah. I think... We all need to thank Micah yes. for yeah. this. This was uh, a lot of fun. I got to see a movie I've been looking forward to seeing for a long time. Mm -hmm. You got to see Vanessa, the uh, yeah. Capricorn one. Yeah, I've never seen it. <laughs> had not heard of it before. And it's fake, guys. Fake. <laughs> fake news. It's a movie. It's a movie. 
with a plot. <laughs> I want to thank everybody else who's uh, liking and sharing the posts yes, and uh, mm-hmm. commenting, sending us little messages. Ron sends me a, a Facebook message every mm-hmm. once in a while, usually something very funny that is inappropriate for the two of you, but he knows that I'm <laughs> a weirdo. And, of course, you know, Danny, who's working yeah. feverishly behind the scenes, Carlos, who's uh, reposting everything on Instagram. Thanks, yeah. brother. Yeah, thank you. And everybody out there who's doing all that stuff and partic- participating in the Value for Value. Uh, Eric, we yes. skipped yours to do, Micah's, so this oh, means right. you're the next choice. I'm go- and I'm going to go with kind of a continued theme. Alien Horror. No. Alien Horror. Vanessa's, That's Vanessa's favorite. Yes. I fucking hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this colored the way I saw Nope. Uh, because prior to seeing it, I saw that uh, the anagram for nope, it is, uh, am I using the right word, anagram? Epon? Uh, nope, not of planet Earth. Yes, is, I did oh, know that. Yeah, and maybe I shouldn't have known that going in. Uh, yeah, that that is one of those things. And like them not using UFO yeah. is also yeah. a bit of a spoiler. Not yeah. a spoiler, but like it's just kind of telling. Like, why are they avoiding that word? And then, yeah, I like. Well, I mean, we're avoiding that word. That's no longer. Oh, to- the exactly, terminology. exactly. That, that is go. where we're at. God, oh, those YouTube society. videos are so wild. Yeah. Fuck it. Anyway, speaking, okay. So speaking of real quick, YouTube. I'd like to welcome. We seem to be going to continue to get a lot more YouTube listeners. Oh, cool. So remember, anybody out there that's. Uh, listening do the classic like and subscribe because that way you're going to know exactly when we show up and you can come over and check us out we had the fastest s- largest group of listeners on our last release so wow cool. keep coming in and listening more and enjoy the youtubiness Ooh, i do it is very mesmerizing watching us on youtube because <laughs> you get to see our little you know audio and it's fun yeah All right, well, you guys heard them. Uh, We are out of here. Like and subscribe. Yeah. Transportation and other considerations for Strange Eons Radio produced by Pan Am Airlines. When you think of traveling, think of Pan Am. You can't beat the experience. Guests of Strange Eons Radio stay at Econo Lodge Everett. It's an easy stop on the road, if you know what we mean. Strange Eons Radio is recorded live in front of a studio audience. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving us a positive review on your favorite podcast app. Sit, Ubu, sit. It is my birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Vanessa. Oh, you guys remembered.